Hi and welcome back at the museum. Today I would like to share the story with you that transpired over the past few months with Jamie Haddad. Jamie contacted us that he need his battery refurbished for his DCC 170 portable. He sent us the battery and we refurbished it for him and he became a Patreon after uh, for the museum. So after he uh, received the battery back and put it in his portable, the portable was still not working and he called us and then we found out during that phone call that Jamie Haddad is the drummer for Paul Simon, Sting and Carly Simon. He asked us whether we could take a look at his portable to see whether it needs restoration or anything else. And he was coming to LA last Saturday to do a recording at Capitol Studios in Studio A. So he invited us for that session. During that session, there was also a scheduled plan for uh, us to interview him to see how he had actually used this DCC 170 and how he obtained it. During uh, the recording session, it turned out it was so chaotic and, and hectic and the studio was fully booked that there was really no time for the interview. But he did give us the 170 and it's a very special edition. We have never seen this before. This is a, an edition with a serial number ending in 03, which uh, by itself we have never seen before. But it's also um, only for in-flight sales, meaning that he had picked it up during duty-free or uh, purchased it on board of an airplane. The manual is only in Chinese, so it was part of an experiment that Philips did with uh, the airlines. At least that's how far we have got during our in investigation. Because there was no time for the interview uh, last Saturday, he offered to do the interview over Skype this week, which we did. We already apologized for the uh, bad video and audio quality that Jamie, together with his dog, uh, did the interview uh, using Skype. But it was interesting enough to, for us to be sharing it with you. When Jamie found out how special uh, this DCC 170 was for us, he made it kindly available to the museum. So it's on display here now. I hope you will enjoy this story. since I was, you know, four years old, started playing and I started playing professionally when I was 14. And then um, one thing led to another. I ended up going to you know, college for music at Berkeley College of Music. <clears throat> I was uh, focused on being a jazz musician the whole time. Uh, and, um, and then uh, I ended up teaching at Berkeley for another, for 18 years. Started that after I got married you know, when I was around, you know, 38 years old or so, uh, teaching there. But you know, I, I'd been a jazz musician my my whole time, and then getting to be around, I think it was when I was, uh, I started playing with Paul, 20 years ago. So I'm 60, 66 now. So. Uh, you know, started playing with Paul in like 98, something like that, 1998. And, um, uh, you know, I still continue to do, you know, you know, play drum set and play percussion for you know, a lot of different people uh, all the time. And that's all I do. And then uh, the last couple of years, I was with Sting and Paul, and uh, we used our bands together as a, his uh, guitar tech and uh, and I were friends. Our kids actually played together in the schoolyard, and um, I, I gave him a CD of me playing to solo percussion, uh, you know, multiple tracks, you know, like, you know, seven or eight tracks of percussion, and conceptually making these little compositions. And then he was playing it one day in the SIR Studio Instrument Metals in, in New York, uh, just testing out the sound system because they needed a playback and uh, Paul walked in and heard it, took his guitar out, started playing and asked what that was and he said it's my neighbor and he said wow, he said well if you call them do you think he'd come down and so uh, that's how that started 
talk. So in, in 60 years in music, if, if you would have to pick your favorite project that you that you worked on so far, what would be your choice? Oh, well, they're different for different reasons. Some are, have a spiritual awakening component to them. Uh, some have, you know, uh, uh, an excitement component to them because of the number of people you've played. Like with Simon and Garfunkel, we played uh, in front of the Coliseum in Rome for 600,000 people. Wow. It's the largest single audience, the largest audience for a single act, I think, ever. When music acts as a passport into another dimension instead of entertainment. And, uh, you know, I think that's the most significant thing that's happened to me because I try to carry that into all my music. And, you uh, uh, contacted uh, the DCC Museum and even became a patron. Uh, how did you find uh, the DCC Museum? Well, you know, I, when I realized I had this machine, and I'm just trying to get rid of things that, you know, I have a value that I know about, but I was clueless about its value. And uh, so I searched online and then I thought I would just sell it. And, and then when I, it wasn't working, you know, properly because I just, you know, imagined that the battery was, you know, defunct. And at that point, I, um, I reached out to you guys and uh, Ralph, you were awesome. And you, uh, you made it easy for me to, uh, you know, find out, you know, more and more about my machine. And then you, after we met in Los Angeles, you checked out my machine and, you know, and, and ethically you, uh, you know, talked about all the different aspects of you know, where we're at in dealing with a machine like mine. And it turns out that I do have a unique machine, uh, but more unique for its packaging than the machine itself. Correct. So uh, uh, I thank you for that, and uh, good luck with the machine. So where did you, um, where did you buy it? To the best of my knowledge, I think I bought it in... Um, uh, at the uh, uh, duty-free shop in Amsterdam at the airport. The, what I used it for was record. I was in a, a band for 11 years with a great uh, saxophonist named Dave Liebman. Uh, we had a quartet with uh, Phil Markowitz on piano, a great pianist, a great guitar player named Vic Juris, and Tony Marino on, um, on bass, and Dave Liebman on saxophone. I played drums and percussion in the group. And so for a while I used it and I had you know, I adapted a, a high quality uh, a Sony uh, uh, microphone, but it, it you know, it is as interesting as of, of a, a, a stopgap in a way a machine it was to incorporate the use of cassettes, which everybody was using, uh, and and some sort of other digital uh, you know, like that machine or something like that. Uh, it it just it just you know after a while I just. I think I switched over to uh, a compact disc player, and um, I, did, I did more recording on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was interesting, and I always was fascinated by how well the mechanism was. You know, compared to a normal cassette machine, it had it just had more, you know, just more intelligence and bells and whistles on it. And it seemed to be made really well. But uh, as you're uh, telling me, it's. Uh, it has a fragile side to it with the recording heads. I have a turntable. I mean, I have, I have, a, uh, I have a turntable that someone put together with, for me that's kind of, uh, you know, highly uh, 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 you know, personalized. And then uh, I have, a, I have a Westlake Audio speakers, BBS M6s. And then also downstairs, I have a Voice of the Theater speakers, the old Altec Lansing speakers that sound fabulous, but I would never mix on those, but they're fun. It's mentioned and, that uh, you have over a thousand different pieces of, of musical equipment in your home? Uh, it's becoming less and less. Uh, I've, um, you know, I've, I've always collected, you know, small, I mean, I must have a hundred different shakers, kinds of shaker instruments, you know, literally, you know, one between ones I've made and ones I've found, I mean, I always have kind of... Uh, a lot of drums and I had duplicates of drums and as I got older I would get find some I preferred over others so I've been liquidating and giving away as many as I can to students and, uh, and just so just the hair still out on my bass drum to try to get a more muted sound. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting instruments from uh, the sun drum from a gentleman from Stockholm named Walter, Walter Percussion. It's very interesting. And, all these magnets slide up and down and 
create, it's got a built-in microphone. You can change the pitches. Various snare drums, air picked out and a lot more in cases, gongs, and stands, and all kinds. And, yeah. Normal drum sets packed up and stuff I just took with me on the road. In here and in the garage, there's a lot more workshops to be working on things. But you can see it's kind of endless. You know. And it used to be even bigger, you said. Oh, yeah, twice as big. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's what's happening now. Okay. Doing, doing my best. Okay. To, uh, well, um, thank, thank you, Jamie, for, uh, for hosting us Saturday. Thank you for making that uh, uh, rare player available to us. It will be uh, in the museum. So if you ever, you know, back in Los Angeles, you always have a place here and, and you know, take a, take a look at it and where we're going to put it on display because it's, it's the packaging and the player, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty special. Okay. Well, thanks again. Okay, thank you so much, Jamie. In this shot, both packages are shown. So what are specifics on this player? Firstly, the packaging was obviously made smaller for practical in-flight sales. Secondly, the power adapter was multi-voltage, not very commonly done by Philips on any portable. Thirdly, the manual is only in Chinese. And lastly, the 03 version was only used for special projects or for the Aristona brand. The only thing that could have made this story any better is if Jamie was able to find the original drum solos recorded with this player. But he will keep on looking. Hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.